The right to keep and bear arms shall be infringed if one former Supreme Court justice gets his way. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Green with Bill Whittle and Scott Ott, and this is Right Angle, brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. And Gent's former Supreme Court justice, thankfully retired, John Paul Stevens wrote in a New York Times op-ed this week urging for a repeal of the Second Amendment. We have never had anything from the Bill of Rights repealed, or, well, <laughs> at least not officially. We've had some questionable uh, cases down the line. Anyway, uh, here's what he wrote in the New York Times. Uh, he was talking about the, uh, the, the big parade, protest, whatever, uh, for gun control in Washington over the weekend, and he said, that support is a clear sign to lawmakers to enact legislation prohibiting civilian ownership of semi-automatic weapons, increasing the minimum age to buy a gun from 18 to 21 years old, and establishing more comprehensive background checks on all purchases of firearms. But the demonstrators should seek more effective and more lasting reform. They should demand a repeal of the Second Amendment. Now, putting aside the fact that, as Glenn Reynolds noted today, that it's a, a tacit admission that the Second Amendment recognizes an individual's right to keep and bear arms, Scott, would you walk us through what I think is the unlikely process of repealing the Second? <laughs> well, and I, I'm tempted to say, go ahead, make my day, because <laughs> actually they would be pursuing constitutional remedy to what they perceive as a constitutional problem. And that's Precisely. really kind of a first time thing we're hearing from the left, because normally they want to pursue extra constitutional remedies like lawfare. Um, to get things to deal with things or writing uh, laws that they think that they can sustain a majority and basically overcome any objections to it. But so this is actually, for, to John Paul Stevens' credit, he's actually suggesting something that is provided for in the Constitution, that there is a mechanism for amending the Constitution. And previous examples have shown that you can repeal an existing amendment. Um, and so all that said, that's that's probably the best possible spin I could put on the thing. Um, the troubling part of this is that John Paul Stevens, who was a Supreme Court associate justice, somehow thinks that if you got rid of the Second Amendment, you get rid of people's right to keep and bear arms. In other words, he thinks that it is the Constitution itself that grants that right to keep and bear arms rather than the Constitution basically, it's a brushback pitch from the framers of the Bill of Rights who said, look, don't mess with this, boys. Early on, when they were in the process of the ratification debates in 1787, 88, 89, um, talking about uh, this this proposed Bill of Rights that um, essentially is what got the Constitution ratified was the promise of a Bill of Rights. Some of the opponents of a Bill of Rights said, look, if you start enumerating rights that uh, that belong to the people, then the assumption will be that anything you don't enumerate doesn't exist. In addition, if you start enumerating rights, you may create an atmosphere that says, oh, this is something about which the federal government is concerned, and therefore we may want to consider regulating this area of life within the bounds, you know, prescribed by the by the Constitution itself. So th there were some serious thinkers along the way who were saying, "Don't do a Bill of Rights. You're gonna you're gonna open up a can of worms that you can't possibly anticipate." And so I, you know, the other thing is that John Paul Stevens, a Supreme Court justice at one point in his life, <laughs> uh, doesn't seem to understand that the Ninth Amendment would, would still exist, which, to paraphrase, says, "Hey." Anything that we didn't say here in the Constitution, any rights that we didn't specifically enumerate here, still belong to the states and to the people. So shut up. <laughs> oh, so shut up. Amendment? I love that. Hey, uh, Scott, since you didn't actually walk us through the constitutional process. Of, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, no, 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 no. But, <laughs> but, but I want to go to somewhere uh, a little different with, uh, with a quick follow up here. Instead, would you walk us through the prayer you give that the founders were wise enough to make it so difficult to repeal anything out of the Bill of Rights? <laughs> well, of course, when I first heard about John Paul Stevens' proposal that we uh, repeal the Second Amendment, my thoughts and prayers went out to him. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is the reaction of everybody on the right. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, that, that he will invite more problems than he can possibly anticipate because you need a bunch of states. You need like 38 states yep. in order to get uh, an amendment passed. And it is a very difficult uh, road to navigate. Um, and in fact, you might find that the backlash there actually divides people more than the current debate does over the Second Amendment and gun control. 
Well, that's something I want to get to, uh, I think, at the end of this segment. But in the meantime, Bill, let's imagine that the worst has happened, that this unlikely repeal of the Second Amendment, it makes it through the high bar of Congress, it makes it through the higher bar of the Senate, it makes it across the extremely high bar of getting 38 states to approve this repeal. And then Congress goes and passes sort of a, a, a Volkstead Act of gun control, which bars semi-automatic weapons, just like the left and the gun grabbers have been looking to do for so long. The law is now on their side. The Constitution is now on their side. And the federal government says, Bill, you have to turn in or so we can destroy your AR-15 and your 1911-45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Well what done, do do? by the way. What do you do? Well, I think what we do as a country is we, we have the exact same effectiveness on banning guns as the Volstek ad had on banning drinking. I mean, mm. uh, as if yeah. we don't need a better example, the entire purpose of this was proposed by progressives to eliminate drunkenness, to eliminate the drunken worker coming home and, and beating up his wife and family, and that's why we're going to enforce a law that says that you can't drink alcohol, which we've been doing as a species for probably nearly as long as we've been eating things, <laughs> Just uh, about. which is a long time. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and Steve Green has some scotch almost that old. Um, but in any event, what, what the Volstead Act does, or prohibition basically, what prohibition does is it shows us precisely what would happen in a case like this. Yeah. Uh, it shows us what is not known about the prohibition era is that drinking increased during the, during the Volstead Act. Actual, the actual incidence of people drinking uh, and the number of people fell to alcoholism and, and, and things like family. It was a boon to organized crime too. Oh, well, yeah. that's the entire second side of the story. So, so you have the practical example of what's wrong with it. That won't deter them. Um, but what, what you have to come down to, again, is simply the, the one thing I keep coming back to on this. If you make it a felony to own a weapon, then the only people that will consider turning in weapons are people who are very concerned about being felons. Uh, the people who are already felons, I don't imagine, are going to be much deterred mm. by all of this. So what you're essentially doing is you are making sure that guns are removed from the hands of the American people and not from the hands of criminals. And the, the ultimate reduction of this insanity that the left believes in is the idea that a gun-free zone, a sign that says this is a gun-free zone, is going to prevent a, a murder. In other words, you've got an individual who's so disturbed and so broken that he's now prepared to go and commit the most heinous moral act in the human inventory. I'm going to go in and attempt to mass murder as many children as I possibly can premeditatively just for the sheer sport and glory of it. And that these people will be deterred by things like, well, this is a gun-free zone. Oh, well, there go my plans. You know, I didn't want to break the gun-free zone law. I'm ready to break the ultimate law of murder against the human species, but I'm not going to break the gun-free zone law. The, 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 the mental ridiculousness of this, the sheer preposterousness of it, is at the heart of all of these things. And as far as his motivation goes, um, uh, Justice Stevens, first of all, makes you wonder what, how many people have suffered as a result of his rulings over the years hey. if he is, in fact, proposing uh, taking away a fundamental natural right guaranteed by the not only by the Constitution but by the Bill of Rights what what other legislation has he ruled on during the course of his storied career I wonder uh, that got us into this mess but finally when it comes right down to it he said well the recent activism in Washington shows us that okay I don't know what the numbers were but let's say you have a big march in Washington a big one a, a genuine million person march it's a pretty big deal that's a very big deal a million people in Washington show up. Well, there's a, roughly 300 million adults or so in this country, so you basically got one-third of 1% 1 of the population to show up for this thing. And that means that 99.6% of the population isn't there at that march. Some of the people believe in what the march believes in, and a lot of people don't. So this entire idea that, hey, 50,000 kids showed up, you know, so therefore this ancient forget ancient it's not even you can it, scott made the natural law case which i believe in completely but put that aside what you're talking about is progressives basically forming legislation to make sure that human beings which i consider to be the most valuable species on earth 
is the only species on Earth that is not able to defend itself. The only one. Cockroaches defend themselves, ants defend themselves, bacteria defends themselves, sponges defend themselves, but humans can't defend themselves because that offends the, um, the, the, the sensitivities of people at cocktail parties. And let me just add one thing. Sure. When you understand what drives the progressive mindset about this, it's two things. We want a population we control. We can understand that. But I don't think most people understand that what drives the politicians and the movie stars on this is that whether they realize it or not, being protected by armed people is a perk for them. And they don't want everybody to have that perk. In other words, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Jerry Brown and Dianne Feinstein are protected by people with with weapons, and so is Barbara Streisand and Steven Spielberg and George Clooney. They're all protected by people with weapons. They can afford it, and they can be protected by people with weapons because they're very important people, much more important than just the average person who should not have the right because they might just go nuts and start shooting up their valuable uh, lives. And once you understand that it's essentially the ultimate perk of the elitist, that my life is worth being defended and yours isn't, and I'm going to make it so that only I can have this protection, then everything gets really clear. Yeah, it sure does. And it's also just a, another form of dependency on the government, not just for uh, your retirement or your health insurance, but your, your very ability, your very right to defend yourself. Uh, let's suppose, this may sound a little weird, but you know who I feel sorriest for in all of this gun control debate over the last couple of weeks? Bill Clinton, if you can believe that or not. Uh, poor Bill Clinton. He saw the writing on the wall in 1994 when Congress was turned over to Republican control for the first time since, I think, 1952. And a big cause for that was the assault weapons ban that the Democratic Caucus or uh, Congress passed and that Bill Clinton signed. And he has been warning and warning his fellow Democrats about this all the time. In fact, he, uh, and nobody's listening anymore. He tried to help his own wife, the most uh, uh, preordained candidate in Democratic history, maybe, to run for president. And, and he wasn't listened to by her either. Otherwise, she'd be president today. And now... Here we have uh, Democrats pushing for the craziest gun control ever, actually repealing the Second Amendment. And there's Bill Clinton saying, you know what? We've got a real chance to take back the House this fall, and you guys are going to blow it. And Democrats aren't listening. That puts a smile on my face. And that mine is your too. right. I'm, I'm sorry, what, Scott? Uh, uh, mine, too. Oh, all of us. See? Oh, hell yes. So, uh, Democrats, ride this issue. Ride it hard. Don't listen to Bill Clinton. He's a total loser. Got that? All right, good. We're on the same page. That's your right angle on that. Thanks for watching. This has been made possible by the paying members of BillWhittle.com. If you like what you see, click on over and join us. We'd love to have you on board. And until then, we'll see you next time.